Well, one of the things that I really like about this, it can be a little bit jarring the first time you read it, but one of my favorite parts is he plays with um, one of the uh, phrases that the United States government used in several treaties. Did you recognize it when I read it? So I'll, I'll just highlight it again for you. Um, I kept what I thought of as a pack with a dying creek, as long as the water flows and the grass grows. So many treaties have that language, that you can have this land as long as the grass grows and the water flows. So I really, it's one of my favorite lines out of this particular short story because I like that he is kind of saying to the reader, well, you know, I'm making this promise with a dying river because most people think of indigenous peoples as a dying breed and the river's dying and I'm not going to keep my promise anyway either. So it's just kind of a multiple kind of phrase in just a few short words. So this is really good. It has some really um, interesting things. So I would highly recommend, since you can tell it's kind of a, you know, you can read, that's the beauty of short stories. You can pick it up, put it down, pick it up, put it down. So. It's got some older things and some more contemporary things, older as in 1960s older, but um, I highly recommend it. These are probably a little bit harder to get a hold of, um, but um, if you can, I would also recommend them. I think I will go with Trailing You by Kimberly Blazer first. She is... Um, an indigenous poetess, and she has some really interesting things to say. And I picked out three selections today from her book, and I think three from Christos. So the first one I chose is Don't Send Me Any Surveys. If you ask me what color is the sunset, I could not answer you because the sunset is alive and changing. As I am too, you ask me, do I believe A, B, or C? And I can't answer you because I believe what the sunset tells me. And it tells me something new each day. Don't send me any surveys. You grow impatient with me. When I ask you what the questions mean, they are obvious, completely objective, require no thought, you say. I wonder to myself why you ask them. But I try to be cooperative. You ask me where I was born, where I live, and I can't answer you because I am part of the life that has ever been, that lives in the trees, in the earth, in the air, the same life that was born in my grandmother and my mother and now in me. You ask me how old I am, 12 to 18, 19 to 26, 27 to 35, 36 to 42. How can I answer that when I am so old and so young at the same time? If you ask a butterfly its age, would she be as old as the larva from which she came? The age of the caterpillar that crawls about? As old as the cocoon tucked under the leaf of the lilac bush? Or as young as the butterfly that flits about the summer flower? Until you learn to understand the questions, don't send me any surveys. So I can see some smiles. You like that one, huh? That's a pretty good one, right? So the next <coughs> one I chose 
is Native Americans versus the poets. You know that solitary Indian sitting in his fringe leathers on his horse at the rise of the hill, face painted, holding a lance, they're just at the horizon? That guy's got a PhD. He's the Indian for Mankato State or Carroll College. Indian professors at universities throughout the country. Exhibit A, no B, wait C. Just solitary romanticized A. Not much of a threat that way. Real trouble is America. Still doesn't know what to do with Indians. Looked for your books lately in Powell's or 57th St. Books. Check first in folklore or anthropology. Found Lewis Wolf song in black literature. Hell no wonder we've got an identity crisis. You a poet? No, nah, I just write Indian stuff. <coughs> and the last one from her, unless I can sneak one more in is American Indian Voices. I wonder if this is an Indian poem. So anyway, you say you want to write Indian poems. Some folks, lots of folks, who should know too, will tell you that they should talk about things like Indian ceremonies, animals in the land, the reservation, the old time Indian folks and maybe about the bad things that have happened to Indian people like removal or boarding schools, oh, and relocation. And nowadays about Indian drinking and poverty and fecal, fetal alcohol syndrome, they shouldn't have much to do with clock time and more to do with spiritual things than with religion. And you might want to put in some Indian words too, if you know any. I bet a lot of folks, lots of Indians too, would like the poems pretty much and publish them and read them and talk about them in minority literature classes. So that's one thing I guess you could do. But I think a better thing would be to just write about the things that you know down deep and think about a lot like the memories and the sounds and the smells and the people and the places that never ever leave you, even when you sleep. Because those are the poems life has written in your soul. And it doesn't matter if you don't say any stuff in them. The Indian experts would recognize. Because even though us Indians have never been experts on ourselves, we've done pretty good at finding one another, haven't we? Even when we're all far from home. Indian voices have that deep down sound of Indian people, whether they are writing about catching fish or catching rocks. <coughs> when Brenda talks about an auction in Iowa, it sounds very Indian to me, not because an auction is an Indian thing, but because she is, and that's how she sees it. She talks about families and quilts and good homemade food, and it makes me want to go there too. Same as when she talks about the Red Lake powwow. Yeah, Indian voices do talk a lot about Indian stuff, like ricing and fried bread and bingo, but they talk about computers and carpooling too. Indian experts might write a lot about Indians. Indian voices just write Indian. <coughs> so probably I could sneak one more in, let me find. <coughs> 